Okay, welcome to day two and a half of uh, Digital Hollywood. As I do every time, I will ask how many people have been to a panel before that I've moderated. And yet you still come back. Thank you. Uh, so you know the ground rules. The ground rules are the folks up here are here to educate you, enlighten you, inform you, not to pitch you. If they start pitching, I didn't bring the squirt gun this time, but there will be a virtual squirt gun. Uh, this is totally interactive. The idea is for you to leave here knowing what you came here today to find out. Now, the good thing about this conference, and I say this with a lot of love, there's a lot of panels that are overlapping with similar discussions. So you will hear threads here today that you may have heard yesterday. Uh, you will hear discussion points that are diametrically opposed with things that other people said. If you think anybody up here, including myself, is full of it, raise your hand and make your objection. <laughs> Not yet, Dave. I haven't said anything yet. Um, we want this to be as interactive as possible. If you have questions, we're not doing the normal wait till the end of the... That's... Phone them in. Oh, good, it's not me. <laughs> uh, usually my phone rings on every single panel. Um, if you have a question, ask the question at the time. We're not going to hold questions till the end. With that said, I'm going to have everybody do a short introduction, not a pitch. Explain what you do, how you got to where you are, and what's consuming most of your mind share currently. And we'll start with the illustrious Dave Ulmer. In 30 seconds or less. My name is Dave Ulmer. I handle marketing for Motorola um, for our digital media so services, which encompass uh, video and audio services that cross the boundaries of Motorola's business of mobile phones, which most people know, but also automotive and home solutions. Uh, how did I get to uh, where I am? Um, I've been involved in digital media for quite some time. Uh, since the early days and the, the early Napster and CD recording days up in Silicon Valley when it first emerged uh, and have been tracking digital music for quite some time and its, and its uh, in, incursion into the home and into the minds of all the consumers out there. And I saw mobile is a profound change that's going to take place in the music industry and I wanted to be part of it. Srivats. Uh, my name is Srivat Sampath. I'm the president and CEO of Mercora. We are a 100% user-programmed, user-contributed radio network. We have about a million people in 140 different countries. And essentially what, you, what we do with our software is you download it on your system and you become a radio station. Uh, it was an amazing experiment. How did I get here? Um, my previous company was uh, uh, called McAfee. And, um, uh, for some reason, I thought digital music would be a wonderful place to be. Um, uh, I'm still waiting for the end of that story. <laughs> uh, my name is John Rosso. I'm the Senior Vice President of Affiliate Relations for ABC Radio Networks, um, <coughs> a traditional media uh, person here trying to uh, understand what can be done with the, the mountains of content that we produce every day. Um, some of which uh, we'd like to uh, repurpose uh, into the mobile space, uh, particularly. Uh, how did I, I get here? Um, worked in uh, terrestrial radio all my life, got into the syndication business uh, about 10 years ago, uh, convinced that uh, you know, devices like you know, the, the Blackberry and all the cell phones you guys are carrying around are the, the future radio receivers of the world. I thought it important to uh, be here at Digital Hollywood and at uh, other conferences like this. That's really what's important to us is finding ways to, uh, to use the content we've, uh, we're currently producing and finding new things that we can produce for, for new distribution channels uh, specifically like you know, digital and mobile. Mr. Denbo. I'm Drew Denbo with, uh, with Real Networks. Um, I've been working in the digital music space for a little over six years. Um, started out with a company called Tune2 an internet radio company in 2000, and Tune2 really built the backbone of the technology that is now Rhapsody. Um, Tune2 was acquired by Listen.com in, in uh, the winter of 2001. Um, we launched the Rhapsody Music Service shortly thereafter, and then Real was bought by, or sorry, Listen was bought by Real in the summer of 2003. My focus at, at Real is is really getting the Rhapsody Music Service, which was born on the PC, 
moving it off of the PC and getting it onto network attached devices, um, like one of Ted's favorites, the Sonos Music uh, system, and also onto uh, portable devices like um, like what you see coming out with uh, from Samsung, mm -hmm. SanDisk, and uh, and Creative. Karen. Karen Guildford. Um, I run premium services product management for Yahoo Music. That includes our um, music software applications, Yahoo Music Unlimited, the Music Match products, um, our mobile strategy, and our foray into living room space. And the thing that I'm focused on right now is um, new platforms to distribute this technology. Um, we're look, spending a lot of time looking at mobile, the living room space, kind of like what's next beyond the PC and how we can still use the PC um, to enhance those experiences on different sort of form factors. And what were you doing before this? I've been at uh, Yahoo Music, formerly launched for six years. Oh, wow. um, before that, I did business development um, in for film studio Paramount Pictures. And our other John. Uh, John Lascalzo, <coughs> Vice President, Multi-Platform Music Programming Initiatives for MTV. I like my title because it's really long. Um, <laughs> basically, I work in the music and talent group at MTV and uh, help get uh, our different music franchises, whether it be Discover and Download, uh, our music shows like Big Ten, Elite Eight, onto our different platforms, anywhere from wireless to our channels to Overdrive, mm -hmm. all the different MTV uh, digital and uh, on-air properties, if that made any sense. What am I focused on? Yes. The difference between just because you can and just because you should. Ooh. Thank you. That's a good jumping off point. <laughs> I'm here all week. Ooh, I, like that. <laughs> I like that. Can you differentiate between just because you can and just because you should? Why don't you vamp on that for a minute? Well, I'm, 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 very, I'm a nerd, so I listen to Leo Laporte every week. Um, and we're You're all sorry. focused on the Web 2.0 mm -hmm. conversation and how the parallels between now and uh, seven or eight years ago. So you've got all these companies that are really cool starting to pop up again, mm -hmm. but how do you monetize any of this stuff and how they're going to make money? Have you seen, I, like I've, I mentioned stuff. this the other day, but have you seen echo.com? No, EQO.com? That's one that reroutes calls from your Skype call to your cell phone, but has a data call that could cost you $5. It's a really great technology. Does it work with Ajax? <laughs> it's, it's, Just checking. <laughs> it's amazing. How about that Ruby on Rails? Or I'm sorry? Was that Ruby on Rails? Is that another it's, one? There's, there's a bunch of those. I just hang around developers and listen to what they say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, jumping back to Dave here for a moment, uh, we're, we're here to talk about new business models and new revenue streams. Um, I will let you do a short pitch. Uh, explain to everybody, if they're not familiar, what iRadio is. Sure, so iRadio is a new um, radio subscription service that we've developed at Motorola that's giving the, the control back in the hands of the consumer. Let them choose from hundreds of channels of digital radio, um, any kind of music and talk that you can imagine. Um, and take it anywhere you go on that device that you happen to have with you, wherever you are, which is your mobile phone. And we've built an ecosystem, understanding that you don't listen to music and you don't watch TV right now on your mobile phone. You watch TV on your TV. You listen to music in your car. So we've built this ecosystem using the magic of Bluetooth so that you can sit in your car, your car knows it's you, it talks to your phone invisibly, and it plays the songs that are coming out of your, your cell phone. Um, and you know, back to the question of because you can versus because you should. You know, I'm in this business because I'm really passionate about it. And because you should, somebody has got to fix radio. Uh, I had this painful set of meetings last week with radio program directors who explain to me how they decide what to play on the radio. Do you think the consumer has anything to do with it? It is all ad sales driven on their surveys. I don't know if you're aware of this. I felt necessary to bring this up. The people who decide what ratings are are people that are called at random and given pieces of paper to write down what they <coughs> listen to on the radio. They have to remember each day what they listen to and write it down and then mail this in each month. And I tried to figure out what kind of people do this. Well, people who have a lot of time on their hands um, and, and feel a desire to contribute to society, I guess. So your radio is being decided by some 300 lonely antisocial housewives somewhere in Nashville. 
And we're going there in a couple of weeks. We can visit them. <laughs> Absolutely. We can go, if you can find them. And I just think that's got to change. And the people who decide what to listen to are you. I can listen to my tunes of the Middle Ages if I want to. I can listen to country music. I can listen to angry women radio, whatever I want, um, and not have to listen to what happens to be coming out of the radio. And what's featured on angry women radio? Um, angry women has got a whole selection. We've got um, some Avril Lavigne, some Alanis Morissette, some Blondie, um, a new one, uh, Taylor Swift. Um, it, it really helps keep me centered. So, John, does Teres is Teres <laughs> Pat Benatar used to be on that list. Uh, no? Some of her songs. Are okay. Sorry. John, does Terrestrial Radio have a clue what listeners want? I think Terrestrial Radio has um, uh, a very good clue as to what the listeners want. You know, Dave talked about the 300 uh, antisocial, lonely housewives. Uh, Arbitron, the company that measures radio listening, is maybe a little bit more sophisticated than that. And, and, and there, there is some <laughs> statistical basis for how they actually determine who listens to uh, to which radio stations but you know one of the real fundamental problems in radio is that it is one way so we put these these things up and it goes out and you know we we take to a certain extent on faith that people are actually you know listening to them uh, you don't know for sure if they are and, and and one of our challenges is is how do we create that back channel how do we create a, a much more direct connection to listeners and that's part of what we need to do to fix the things that are broken with radio is create a, a much more um, two-way, much more engaging experience with our listeners. Um, <clears throat> there's no reason why it, with today's technology, if you know you hear an advertisement on the radio and you want to know more about it or if you just want to buy it, that you can't just push a button on your dashboard and, and it shows up by UPS in your house two weeks But later. are we back to what Dave said about that it's ad-driven, not music-driven? Right. Well, but beyond that, you know, what if it's a nice piece to be of EMI, EMI, an EMI artist? Oh, that's, that's different. And, okay. that, and that's okay. That you should buy. <laughs> Well, I, I think getting back to the point of what people want, you know, right. having been in regular old-fashioned radio in New York at K Rock and running focus groups and running there's nothing old-fashioned about K Rock and, and well and deal, well K Rock well, I worked at K Rock LA that's another story but in K Rock New York we you know we get our research back every week and we Arbitron is you know as John said you know they have their methodology of once you understand what their sense is you can kind of program around that but the fact is that going to MTV and then running you know we've got maybe 60 65 internet stations and be able to see exactly what people are listening to and what they're skipping and what they're, what they're gravitating to, it's the right. same thing. And how people are you like utilizing that information? What's, what well, what, how what changes take place on a daily or weekly basis we'll, we'll based tweak, on that data? We'll tweak the music in those stations to, you know, to kind of avoid you know, playing crap. You know, to, to not, you know, we want to play the hits because that's what people want to hear. Right. And that, that, that's the sad thing that kind of gets lost in, in the new world. Is that People like what they like, and they like things that are good. And so choice is not necessarily always, the wide choice is not always great. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that, um, I don't know how many people are familiar, and it's not a pitch, with the, one of the products okay. that we <laughs> have <laughs> at Yahoo Music, <laughs> which is LaunchCast <laughs> Radio, which I think accomplishes a great blend of that. What we do on an individual user basis is take ratings and you know implicit data that we have about play events, make associations <coughs> with other artists, songs, albums, and also add some editorial voice through power rating, um, big hits or emerging artists that we think people need to know about, and then deliver like a customized radio station. So that's one of the things that we're really focusing on right now is how do you bring that paradigm into the car with you know one button on a cell phone or get just one click and how does the information go away and then come back to the user in that kind of two-way, real-time fashion that we can accomplish on the PC very easily. You know, with all the promise of interactivity, do people really want to interact most? I mean, what percentage of, of your audience do you feel really interacts versus they just want to be entertained? I think we, we see a large percentage. I mean, you know, and we've kind of fine-tuned it over the years. I mean, the radio, we feel like we get a, a high level of interactivity through ratings and, and kind of customizing. One of the other products is music videos. People there kind of just want to have things fed to them. But I think what people want is relevance. I mean, they watch one music video, they want the next one to be something that we know is keyed somehow off of what they just watched. And I think the same paradigm is on the audio side. 
Drew, what are you seeing? Yeah, from a, from a Rhapsody perspective, we see that about, you know, we have the Rhapsody radio product that's part of the Rhapsody. Um, he got Rhapsody in there three times in one <laughs> set. <laughs> Rhapsody, Rhapsody. <laughs> Sorry. You almost well, beat Brad Dewey at Medem two years ago, where he mentioned Napster <laughs> to go 30 times in one sentence. Go ahead. I'm going to try to eclipse that. Um, so we have a radio service that about 5% of our overall subscribers uh, are subscribed to. But about 30% of our overall usage is in radio, Rhapsody Radio. And, <laughs> and so that means that obviously 70% of our usage is, inter is interactive, people actually moving off the radio product and, and uh, choosing their own playlists, building their own playlists, um, and in interacting directly with the service. So you, have, you offer, an, as does Yahoo, a lean in and lean back experience. Exactly. You have the choice. Yeah. So you're not forced to interact all the time. You have a question. Yes, sir. Make it really mean. Right. No, no, it's interesting. People just okay. So it's, a, it's a good point. Yeah. Come I on up. Sorry, I'm Jim. Uh, <laughs> I just thought that the, the uh, yeah, I'm a radio. I still like to listen to new music, right? And I like that to come to me via my friends. Mm -hmm. But most of them, where do they hear it first? I think it's a radio station. Yeah. And that's somebody's job, a program manager, somebody who's not listening to that group who says, this is what you should be playing, I think. Jim, you bring up yeah. a good point, which so is um, there is a discovery function in music, which mm -hmm. is typically uh, done through radio, whether it's terrestrial, satellite, or even uh, the internet radio. And there is something that happens after discovery, which is the song becomes a hit in your head, which is when you go either you buy the CD or you get the digital download and you put it in your iPod and they're very distinct functions. It takes about seven to eight listens before a song becomes a hit in your head. And it's a fascinating data point and, and that's why you know I, I keep telling the labels where the same economics that work on the internet work for radio. You know, if you send out a thousand emails, two percent of the people will click on it. If you put up a thousand banners, one and a half percent of the people will click on it. If you get a thousand listens, one and a half percent or two percent of the people will buy the CD. So digital music is not too different from anything else we see in the internet space, and uh, and that's the that's the reason you know radio as a discovery medium is very powerful. Now there are multiple ways of programming radio. You can do it the way uh, terrestrial radio stations do it, which is you do surveys and playback, or you flip the model entirely on its head and you say hell, I don't care, I'm going to have willing broadcasters and willing listeners and let them do what they want, which is what we do. We have 100,000 channels any minute of, you know, of music from all over the world. And if I want to listen to Korean pop music, I'll find a Korean pop music station and listen to it, right? And that's, you know, that's where it's going. It's going to a model where <coughs> it's user programmed because no station is ever going to be able to you know, find that perfect mix of music just for you. And it's going to a model where it's lean forward, where you say, I'm in the mood for, you know, Monday morning songs, okay? And the system just goes out and says, okay, here are all the Monday morning songs, right? So it's a, you bring up a good point. I think one of the things that you brought up that's interesting is the discovery piece and, and bringing up the things that you said were radio and your friends and how you find it. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. I mean, at the end of the day, all the music's going to exist out there, and then it is, how do you find the thing you forgot about? How do you find the thing that's new? And so one thing you know, we haven't touched on is also is the community aspect and linking those people up. So you know, you, what if you found a station in, this, in the Mercora service that was programmed by somebody, and you're like, I want more by this person. So being able to also forge a connection with, with someone else who made a relevant recommendation and getting more from that person. Yes, that how, do you, how do you, how, at Yahoo or at Rhapsody, how do you balance uh, social recommendation versus 
using recommendation services such as uh, Pandora or things like that? Well, we, we have our own editorial staff that, um, you know, that builds those recommendations, and, and yet we, we have both a um, community area within, within the service um, where people can share playlists. Uh, you can actually, um, soon you'll be able to su subscribe to other subscribers generated playlists. Um, so, you know, it's actually, I'd say it's more user driven what you're looking for. If you're looking for community based recommendations, you can get those. If you're looking for our ed editorial based recommendations, those are there for you as well. It's pretty much balanced, I would say, evenly. John, what's Urge going to look like? It's going to be fantastic, but you told me not to do any plugs. Well, it's not a plug per se, but give us, I mean, okay, you've seen what everybody else here, you, you've obviously looked at what everyone else is doing. What are you going to do better? Um, Where's the room for improvement? Are everybody familiar with what Urge is? Anyone familiar with what Urge is? <laughs> okay, good. Why don't you tell them about what Urge is? It's, our, it's our music download store that will launch uh, in Q2. It's uh, currently in beta. It's very exciting. Q2 um, this year? Yes. Okay, good. Just checking. Yeah. Um, basically, r radio right now, uh, we're developing how we're going to do radio. Um, and there will be opportunities for the user to create their own playlist and kind of modify each station, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we'll also use the MTV stations that are in Urge on .com as well. So they'll kind of go back and forth. As, as to the user experience, um, I haven't worked directly with that, so I don't want to Miss misspeak for Michael Bloom and his team. Okay. Taking the cop out. So the gentleman from Coding Ec Coding Technologies, you have a question. Uh, yeah, maybe one example would be the discovery portion. So uh, uh, you know, Arctic Fun is great, but it's it's about something the fan either interested or not interested. And the other approach <coughs> is also a little bit worrisome because if you have you know willing providers of content and willing consumers of content, I don't know. But But how much, new, how much new music do you want at a time? Do you want to be bombarded with 10 things you've never heard before, or do you want that mixed in with things that make you feel comfortable? I hope that people who are more intelligent than I am can answer that question. I don't know what I want. Is there anyone up here well, that's like more to intelligent? Well, I'd like to respond to that a little bit, though. You know, there are services like you know, Pandora that can sort of characterize the sort of, sort of song that you like and give you a lot more like it, or services that monitor your you know, your thumbs upping or thumbs downing on songs and, and keep providing you more and more refined estimations as to what you're going to like. But <clears throat> what I think is really interesting is when something comes completely out of left field that has no relation to the song you were just listening to or to what you normal or what you would buy in a record store, something that somebody says, hey, you know what, this is nothing like you'd ever really, you know, we, we think you would buy, but, you know, listen to it. We think it's kind of interesting. In terrestrial radio, there's been this Jack FM format that's popped up in the last couple of years, which is, you know, they say we play anything and they make it sound on the air like it's, um, you know, very unplanned and unscripted, when in reality it's one of the most highly researched music formats in radio history, but it does throw a lot of things at you from left field, and it's found a huge audience in most of the markets uh, in which it's been put on the air. I so don't know anywhere else that you would hear Prince followed by Asia. There are, there are certain things that uh, that uh, whether that should be allowed to, to happen to or the not. uninitiated may sound like train wrecks, but there is a, there's a, there's an art and science behind it, and there's a reason why they put that Asia song after that that Prince song, and they, and they held an audience, you know, across that segue. But uh, and my point is, if you if you, sub if you subscribe to a service or to a methodology that just keeps giving you a, a more and more refined version of the same thing, you really don't give yourself the opportunity to to, to have something come out of left field and some new experience hit you. Yeah, that's the, that's the danger of customized radio. The danger really is if you customize it so much that you're only getting what you think you want, you're not getting what you need. Yeah, I absolutely right. agree with that. I've, I've heard some test samples of, we've been going through this for years now, of all these recommendation engines, and I think there's two basic types. You have the machine recommendations, which is some kind of algorithm uh, that will really look to find the exact same patterns 
not necessarily beat, not necessarily tempo or pitch or notes or range or pit, uh, uh, you know, but a combination of all of that. And you'll end up with a stream of songs that really do sound a whole lot like each other. And it almost is like a bad karaoke night uh, after a while. Uh, the other side is humans, and I'm such a fan of having humans recommend, you know, just that's where you Except get the 300 great DJs. Nashville. Well, the good DJs it's who good actually do the right <laughs> program their, the, you know, a nice string of tunes. Or um, you've got, uh, you know, musicologists at Rhapsody that uh, will program <laughs> uh, the types of songs that you like and, and, and so, you know, recommendations. And that works great but it's awfully damned expensive. Uh, and I think it's going to end up some combination in between. Question. Be able to vary that. You're right. Yeah. I mean, it can be done technologically, um, and it could be done in a way by by which it's it's based on machine logic as well as user contributed uh, information that gets fed into this recommendation engine. But you also have to look at the flip side. You know, how much time do you spend listening to radio? 35 minutes. Um, is your life going to end if the programming is bad? No. You know, uh, we're not going to sit there and go, boy, this machine doesn't work. I mean, the way we see people use is they come in, they'll search, they'll find a song, and or they'll find a channel, and they'll listen to it for 40 minutes, okay? And, you know, do people complain that the songs, the way they were, you know, put together just didn't make sense? If it didn't, they just switch a channel and go somewhere else. Uh, so, you know, we might be trying to solve a problem that, you know, I don't know whether it needs solving at this stage, as long as you give them reasonable tools. Could be, could be. You, you'd be surprised. I mean, I'm in the business, right? And I'm in the business, and I'm in the business of tracking how many people listen to what every day. Uh, and believe me, I don't make or break their day based on the programming that I provide. Dave, counterpoint? No counterpoint. Um, no, I, I think it's not all, it doesn't have to be rocket science. Um, I, I compare it more to just wandering through the mall, looking, you know, doing window shopping. I find something that I'm attracted to, and I go into that store. Uh, we all have the choice of moving to a different store if we happen to accidentally walk into Victoria's Secret. <laughs> so, Drew, for, as yeah. first on the block, and Yahoo as not last on the block, but most recent on the block, uh, in talking about new models, uh, subscription has been talked about for years. Rhapsody was the first to launch. Is it working? Yeah, it's, I would say that it is working. We have a long way to go. Um, you know, we are, we, right now we have about, about 1.5 million music subscribers across all of our um, different music services. Rhapsody is, is the biggest of those. Um, you know, the, the piece that we're most excited about is the to-go service. And, uh, and I think that when it, when it first launched, um, I think we all launched those services a little bit too early. The technology wasn't quite there. The devices certainly weren't there. The user experience, um, and I throw this out there, right now so that I don't get blasted by all of you in the audience for how bad the, the service uh, was when it first came out. But you know, on the panel. <laughs> and from all of you as well. But, um, but you know, the device, the first generation of the devices that people buy, you had to do a firmware upgrade and there was a five second lag between tracks and it was just kind of a brutal experience. I will say that now it's gotten a heck of a lot better. We've done a lot of work um, on, on making it better. It's one of the advantages of owning a lot of our Technology and owning our own a owning our application. We also work very closely with um, with the device manufacturers. So if you go out and you try today, um, you know, like the Samsung Z5 or the Sandisk E200, you will almost you will not be able to discern between a, a Rhapsody to go track on that device um, or a, an MP3. It's really it's a fantastic experience. Still some work to be done, but you know, it, it, I think it can fundamentally change the way that people. Um, the way that people access and, and consume music. Um, but it, now it's a matter of 
of all of us getting out and educating people that this is something that can be done. You can ditch all your CDs and sign up for a monthly subscription service. What's your churn rate? I can't really, I can't say what, what the churn rate is specifically, but um, but uh, it was it was higher. I don't, mean, I don't mean that to be mean. I mean, no, basically, no, I, people who haven't tried subscriptions say, why would I subscribe? Most of the people I know who have subscribed seem to stay rather than go. Right. So, so specifically on the um, on the to-go service, it's it's without a doubt it's higher right now than on the unlimited service. But we're seeing the people who who joined recently, they're staying. Um, you know, the people who've joined over the last six months, they're tending to stay a lot mm. longer. The, we've done a lot of research of that user base who's joined the to-go service, and um, you know, the, the satisfaction level is much higher. So I I anticipate that because they're getting a better experience, they're going to stay on. Karen, what's your, what, what's your data that you um, can share? I mean, I agree with that also. I mean, we, we do a lot of user research, and just anecdotally, I think what we see is once people kind of tip over into the value proposition of the subscription, so they, they take that leap, they, they actually sign up for a trial, that they have a high propensity either to stay, or if they get disenchanted for whatever reason, they will come back, or they might switch between services. So that's kind of what the research is showing us. I mean, if you, that, I think that's the hardest thing, is to communicate what this value proposition of the subscription service is. But once you get over that, I mean, people instantly see it. You talk about switching back and forth. One of the things that uh, I always throw props to him, Ian Rogers, who works with you guys, mm -hmm. uh, created was an uh, interoperable playlist format. Yep. So that you can share a playlist with Drew if Rhapsody also used the same structure. Are you getting any uptake from any of the other services in playing in that sandbox? Um, I mean, well, I let Ian sort of um, focuses on that. I don't I mean, know. Can we do a deal right here between you and Drew? Yeah, we, <laughs> could, we could talk after. Interoperability. We're here, we, all, we always talk about interoperability. We can we can solve part of it right here. Right. I mean, now. I think it's it that would be huge. I mean, between kind of the services on this side of the fence. <laughs> you know, and I don't I don't mean to talk in shorthand, but the way that it works is I can create a playlist in Yahoo, and he's created an XML. XSPF, that basically the playlist that I generate in my Yahoo subscription, if other services use that same architecture, if I send it to Drew, it triggers the same tracks in Rhapsody that it would tra track in Yahoo, and you have a question. It's a standard. It's a, it's a free standard. Yahoo doesn't own the standard. This was a published XML solution. Right. So what it does, so you, you can imagine it this way. It's not actually sending, like say you created a 10 song playlist. It's not sending those 10 files to your friend. What it is is packaging up sort of like the metadata in a group the way that you set it up. And then if your friend, you know, is a Rhapsody subscriber and you're a subscriber to Yahoo Music Unlimited, you could say, hey, I just created the perfect playlist for our dinner party next weekend. Check it out. Send it, they click on it, and then it plays the tracks from the raps. The actual files are coming from the Rhapsody service, but that set of the data and the order of the tracks is from your friend. Well, I mean, we all use common. The you know, metadata is standard. It's just that. the it's just an interoperable format, which right. again makes these services a little more fluid. You can actually subscribe to two of them if you like features on both and you wouldn't have to worry about redoing your playlist. I think a good yeah. analogy for like the interoperability would be a lot of the um, interop interoperability with the instant messaging platforms right now. I mean, I'm on AIM, I created a 30 person list, my friends on Yahoo, pretty hard, big switching cost there, but we still want to be able to talk to each other, so. If you everybody you adopts the standard, no, absolutely, and it's yeah. an easy you know. standard to adopt, so it's something that you should uh, write your congressman in the various places. <laughs> I would say write to Cupertino, but uh, they don't always answer. Um, you had a question down here, I'm sorry. Denmark. Not, 
We, we actually launched um, Real Music this morning in France, Italy, Spain, Germany, and the UK. And it's, uh, it's you'll recognize the Rhapsody interface. Um, it, uh, ding. And, uh, he's working he it. Just passed, he's working it. He's good. You just passed Fred Dewey, and you're on your way to passing Chris Goron. Go ahead. Um, so it's, it's radio and, and downloads right now. Um, we, we are still looking to get the subscription service out there as well. Um, we've, had our, we've had our battles, obviously, with, with Apple, and they're the dominant player right now in, in the space. Um, so they're choosing to, to adopt a closed, you know, closed uh, service, closed architecture. Um, you know, hopefully through telling the subscription message, we'll be able to make an, a dent in that. Uh, but you know, it's, it's definitely interesting what's happened in, in France and in Denmark over the last couple of weeks. How many people here, show of hands, think one year from today, iTunes will be interoperable with other services? <laughs> okay, that's what you I know, t t Can I ask you a uh, question? Yes. What, sh do you think uh, Apple should just pull out of France? Just because? <laughs> Bye. Let's go. I, I think they're taking our ball going home. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, think I, think pull out. I think, well, no, I think there's going to be, I mean, personal opinion, I think there's going to be a domino effect here because Denmark came in yesterday saying they support the French position. There'll be another, you know, the question will be do they pull out of Europe? And but but you know what? That. I mean, there's so a we fundamental pull out of Iraq. I don't know. Yeah, um, but, but let me let me <laughs> to, to answer the you know your question. Can you wrap in Iraq? Right. Uh, <laughs> you've got you've got consumers on one side and you've got capitalism on the other. If I'm if I'm a company, if I'm running a public company, my job is to build shareholder value, and that's what Jobs is doing. The way he's doing it is he's got iPod, he's got an app, he's got a store. And he's saying, look, people are buying it. And the reason they're buying it is it's a complete cradle-to-grave experience that is very, very clean. Now, who cares? You know, capitalism rewards efficiency. Capitalism yeah. says, you know what? You do a good job, the market rewards you for it. When socialist countries like France and, you know, Belgium and Denmark and all these guys start to talk about, oh, we can't do this, you go, listen, you know, that's the reason why half the companies in these countries... Invent your own iPod then. Exactly. But, yeah. let me, but let me ask a question. Uh, just, wait, as wait. an impartial moderator, let me just ask you a question, not as somebody from a record company who will get in trouble for asking this. Um, <laughs> if Microsoft exhibited the same behavior right now, would this be an issue? Or would this have been solved? You, you know, uh, let, me, let, me, let me answer the question. <laughs> the only place where Microsoft was hit with anti-competitive uh, fines is in Europe. And it's an extremely socialist behavior. Guys, I mean, if you want to live in the world of capitalism, you want to build value, you can't do this kind of crap. So I got another question about that. Um, how many people here think that in two years, the iPod will be the dominant portable music device? It is. Absolutely not. It's a not. trick question. And there's no way. Um, I, I know what we're doing. I know what Nokia is doing. Samsung, Ericsson are all working on. Um, I, I was stunned by the statistic that came out that Nokia is now the largest camera manufacturer on the planet. Um, we're number two. <laughs> and uh, that we'll see who's number one and number two when it comes to an MP3 device or you know, a portable music device. But in the same time that you know, you know, Apple has sold some uh, 40 million iPods, there were over a billion mobile phones sold. And those are mobile phones that are inherently an audio device. They aren't made yet, or they weren't made yet, to play um, protected files, DRM wrap files, have enough storage, have good audio capabilities, but believe me, they're coming. No, but there are devices that play protected files. There's Windows Media Center. Yeah, there are now. I'm just saying, yeah. you know, out mm -hmm. of those billion that have been sold, it's right. a very, very small sliver of, uh, First hit the gentleman back there, and then you. Yes, sir. As loud as you can, please. And where are you from? Uh, say who you, who you are and where you're from, so we can attack you later. Where's Terry? Absolutely. The, the camera market outside of the cell phone business, the, the camera market that's left over. Really good Nokia camera. The Carl Zeiss lens. There are a couple of them. Uh, uh, 
But the camera market by itself, if you take away all the cell phones, is bigger than it's ever been. It, it made the market grow by having a lot of lousy cameras. And, and, and say lousy, there are different purpose. You don't yeah. use a camera on a phone to uh, take pictures of the kid's birthday party. Absolutely. It's um, CD quality that's being played over Bluetooth into the car stereo. And, and what we're working on, it's not FM, it's much better experience than using an FM modulator with an iPod by, by leaps and bounds. You know, uh, on your and it's been extremely important. Um, that's what the consumers are telling us that they want. They want high quality digital audio and they'll really, they're willing to pay for it. On your iPod you can do Apple lossless. Uh, there's Windows Media, po Windows Media portable devices that will hand handle Windows Media lossless. You can ramp up the quality level. There's a company that's been hanging out around here the last few days, Music Giants, that are doing Windows Media lossless files for audio files. So if you're listening to it in your living room, it sounds great. And I does anybody feel that there's great market demand out there for higher quality audio? I mean, once you get to a certain point, as Dave said, CD quality in the car seems to be pretty much you know, good enough. And yeah. Some yeah, people call CD different levels of quality, CD quality. If you talk to the satellite radio guys, they'll tell you that's CD quality music too, but anybody who's got any background in you know, audio engineering is gonna know that it's nothing close to that, right? But out of the stream, out of a streaming experience, you mean, not, not a storage and playback experience. No, no, a streaming service is gonna sound pretty lousy. Uh, especially over the over a cellular network where it's competing for other traffic. I mean, things called phone calls sure. you usually do with these things. Uh, but using a cache and forward model where you can provide content onto the phone and then play it back in a, in a delay, um, you can give you the high digital audio quality that you're looking for. But it's not really a fair comparison to, to, to take what you're getting through an Apple iTunes download and what you'd get on a on a phone service. It's sort of it's comparing apples and oranges. But if you yeah. download if you download a file, I mean I've got a Windows uh, smartphone and Apple I have an iPad. Right. The audio quality is comparable on both of them. Now if I try to listen to streaming audio on the smartphone, it's not gonna sound anywhere near as good as a stored file. Or it could be greater. But without making a plug, if you want to listen to it in a car stereo, we can go out in front a little right. later with my car. You had a question right here. Did, did, did we answer your question? I, I don't know if we answered the guy's question. I'm sorry? Did we answer your question? Uh, you know, you, you, one of the things you got to do is, um, at We're least for the mobile phones, when they go to, you know, you can't do it on GPRS networks, you've got to do it on 3G networks. And on 3G networks, you've got to use uh, media format types that are tuned for really high compression at high fidelity. Uh, there's one such uh, encoder called Aug Vorbis. How many of you guys are familiar with that? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, we use Aug Vorbis. We use Aug Vorbis because it's an open standard. But in, in, in 60 kilobits per second, I can pack 198 kilobits per second equivalent on MP3 and Windows Media, right? Are so you laughing because you agree or disagree? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's just a happy guy. And what format you would that say where be? You're from. <laughs> Yeah, so, so you got Aug Vorbis AAC Plus. Uh, you know, there's some good formats you could use, absolutely. So one of the questions we're here to address as we delve into formats is you have a huge, huge audience of people who have spent the last five, six years on peer-to-peer -peer networks who have enjoyed and experienced more music than I think any generation before. They've had access to the library of the world at their fingertips. 
is it possible to convert this audience? And uh, Michael, you can jump in on this. Is it possible? Michael Weiss is here from Morpheus. Uh, is it possible to convert this audience to an audience that will pay to get the music that they were getting for free? What is the, what is the future of either paid peer-to-peer -peer or converting these people to your services? I mean, I think you can convert them eventually in their music listening life cycle. So for instance, at a certain point, people have more money than time. And earlier in their life, they may have more time than money. So sitting on a peer-to-peer -peer network, sifting through thousands of files, finding ones that don't have you know, bugs or are fakes or whatever, is, is a good value proposition because you can devote a couple hours. I mean, I think at a certain point, you just don't have the time to do that. You want it to work. I mean, do you want to go get the downloads, get the files, fill up an MP3 player, and go to the gym? And you might have 10 minutes to do that. And so I think that, that it is possible to do it. Are you going to get a college student who's a sophomore and has six hours to burn, you know, sifting through all this stuff to all of a sudden fork over some cash for what they're getting for free? Probably not. Yeah, I think we, we were talking earlier about um, about all the editorial aspects of, of the service. Rhapsody. I think <laughs> Rhapsody. in Rhapsody, for example. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I think that's one of the key value adds that we bring over a peer-to-peer -peer service where you don't get that editorial content, um, you know, and you don't get the, the uh, editorial staff holding your hand, guiding you through out. If you like Aerosmith, you're going to like the Rolling Stones and, and so forth and getting into music that you've never heard before. I don't think we're going to convert the, the very young demographic, but they were never one of the big spenders you know, on, on CDs even from 18 to 24. Our core demographic is really 25 to, to 55, and, um, and those are the people that I think we are having success converting. Just like you said, they have, they have more money than time. They value the, uh, the guidance of – they don't have time to explore new music. They, uh, they value the guidance of, of our editorial suggestions. So I think we are making headway in that in that area. I think um, it's everybody's right, obviously, that it's if it's easier to get it legally than illegally, people are going to do it legally. And what we're going to do and urge, <coughs> see, I have to get it in because Rhapsody's been getting the plug, mm -hmm. is that there will be editorial content supporting music, so it'll bring you through the experience. But also, what MTV brings to the table is that we have relationships with artists uh, like no other service out there. Period. So we will bring artists into the mix to recommend their favorite songs to be part of our franchises, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want you to squirt <laughs> me if I do any more plugs. That's but okay. Michael, uh, Michael that, is, that's what it is, is, is this it's doable? It's about the brand of the experience. Well, here, here's a question, though. I think it's a good question. I don't think it's so much about how we get the energy that music promotes, but it's the No, I mean, I'm doing it. a third Everybody's plugging something. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but here's, here's the thing. Um. <laughs> Suing Skype, S-K-Y-P-E. <laughs> if the consumer's not going to pay for it, then who should pay for Advertisers. it? Well, it could be advertisers. It could be Coca-Cola. Which gets into the supporting model. Right. Uh, sure. There's a lot of money left over on the table now that the uh, labels are no longer allowed to pay payola. But you're going to get the licenses. That's, that's tough. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the, kid, the kids are not going to pay. Um, the people who grew up on peer-to-peer -peer are actually buyers in training, as uh, someone on this panel pointed out. And at some point, a certain percentage of them will convert to a buying audience, but not before they're 24. Who's paying you now? The advertisers. Listening has to be free. We totally, absolutely what believe have, in You had that. a subscription service that people were paying no, for. We, we, no, we closed it down. Closed it down. We shut it down because... You know, the, the trickle of people who came into pay subscriptions, uh, you know, was just not worth the effort. <coughs> so we, you know, the, the, the big awakening for us was, uh, look, I came from McAfee. We built the world's largest subscription service. We're at 15 million subscribers in four years, right? Very easy. It's a cash, you know, generating machine. We come here, we tried this. We said we can yeah, that was based on you're going to turn my computer off if I don't keep paying. No, that was, ba <laughs> no, that was based on fear. I mean, <laughs> there, there are three businesses you can build. You can, a build a, you can build a great business on fear, you can build a great business on lust, and you can build a great business on greed. You, everything else, you've got to struggle. You've got to struggle, okay? 
Music doesn't fall in any of those three categories, guys. So it's oh, a hard absolutely. one. Absolutely. Lust. Lust. Yeah. Yeah. Angry women. Okay. We come back to that. that uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, you guys know you more haven't about watched music. Shakira's Hips Don't Lie video. But, but you have. know. <laughs> Ted, would you say that we're still in a period with, with all this stuff that nobody's right if everybody's wrong? Or I think we're, in, well, we're ab absolutely in a period where every model is viable yeah. exactly. for a period yeah. of time. It's and a they change, supermodel. and they morph, and if you create a model that, that you can't evolve, then you're screwed. Mm -hmm. You know, look, radio is a $20 billion industry, okay? And it's on a free model. Which right? is interesting. So there's this sleeping giant called digital radio. And uh, I'm sorry that Bob, I mean, I'm glad you're here, John, but I'm sorry that Bob Struble isn't here from Ubiquity mm -hmm. to defend his position. But digital radio rolled out here um, almost six, eight months ago. I don't know. I, I, I talked Paul Reznikoff out of his radio last week. And there's, there's at least a dozen stations roaming around L.A. here. Yep. Nobody seems to even know they exist. Oh, no receivers really available. You're I have very, Paul's. Very hard, yeah. yeah. yeah to we steal we can all somebody. join in on Paul's yeah, receiver. They're, 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 we'll they're very, the they're very hard to, uh, to come across. And uh, unlike, you know, in satellite radio where you had two companies who immediately went out and made relationships with the auto manufacturers and subsidized the uh, installation of receivers in cars, um, the broadcasters have not yet together to do that. There is something called the Digital Radio Alliance, led by Clear Channel and Infinity, uh, with the participation... Two small companies. Yeah, two small companies in the, in the broadcasting business, with the participation of most of the other big broadcasters, and, and on our part at ABC, we're, we've kind of one foot in and one foot out. Some of our markets have chosen to participate, some are not. Uh, and they're trying to drive the adoption, not only of standards and how those channels will be laid out and what the you know, uh, formats will be that will be offered, and even how the, the band will be numbered. I mean, there still is not final agreement yet on whether uh, KLOS's you know, digital channel will be 95.5-A or dash one, or whether we'll start at 108.1 and go on from there. That, that, that's not yet been agreed to. Um, so we don't even know, you know if the radio you buy today is really gonna work a year from now in terms of how you would tune in radio stations. But the so model essentially is based on advertiser support, yeah, free to the consumer the, the, to the compete. The model right now is it's commercial free on the HD channels. The, the HD alliance has basically uh, agreed not to put commercials on any of the digital music channels. There will be talk programming on some of those channels that will have uh, commercials in it, but not on the music channels. And these things will basically be supported by the main channels uh, that are operated. They'll be given is away. Is that for a free. business? Um, it doesn't sound no, like a business. You can't make it up in volume when you're giving it away exactly. for free. But you know, right. the idea, I think, I at least initially, is to try to, um, uh, to to drive distribution and to drive. You know, to, to but what happens audience. on that day when they start playing commercials? Is there is there consumer? I, you know, they'll I, I be in digital I, quality and they'll sound very good. They'll be excellent commercials. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I think that there's the, that that people are trained to uh, <laughs> to listen to commercials. I think if if you if it goes over the top and if you're asking somebody to sit through three or four or seven or in the cases of, you know, for John's old station, K-Rock in New York, you know, I would tune into Howard Stern and get 23 minutes of commercials in a row. You know, I, I mean... We loved every minute of them. People aren't going to listen to that. And if you're an advertiser and you think that your spot, which is airing 14th in that pod of 24, gets heard by anybody, right. you know, you're deluding yourself. Um, so I, I think that the audience will sit through commercials if it means they don't have to pay for the programming. Um, but there's a limit to how much they will tolerate. I also think that as they get older, as these guys are saying, there's a there's a, a point at which you have more money than time, and that applies to radio programming as well. And what we've seen in our business is, it's it doesn't have to be all ad supported. There is actually a subscription model that works with some of our programs. Um, you know, an example would be business programs where um, people would rather give you five, six, or ten bucks a month to know that that program will be available for them whenever they want it and wherever they want it, rather than having to carve out three hours on a Saturday afternoon to listen to it. But this is web-based. Well, web-based or podcasting. Or podcast. well, it doesn't have or to podcast. be web. Once it's, you know, once it's digitized, you can do anything Just you deliver. want. Okay. It, it could be mobile. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Well, so that's the thing that, you know, with Free FM in New York, they have a Pendulette podcast. They break up an hour's show into 20-minute segments, which is a little maddening. But you know what? I wouldn't pay for that, but if they put a commercial at the beginning of it, or, or at the end of it, I wouldn't be upset. And I listen to, to that show more as a podcast than I do over the, over the air. So they could monetize that without even thinking about it. And believe me, they know how to sell commercials. Other questions? Alan, you had a question? Uh, what is your name?
Well, uh, and John, know. nobody's here. But, uh, this is all between us. No, yeah. no one's going to quote you. I mean, first, I, I would I would disagree with the premise that the audience to, to terrestrial radio is declining. It, it it has declined, and as over the last couple of years, actually, there on an average quarter hour basis is more listening to terrestrial radio um, than last year and in the year before and in the year before that. Uh, you know, satellite has gotten an awful lot of play in the press. It's got a lot of mind share, but there's still very very um, little audience to, to satellite radio. I think internet radio is a far bigger threat <coughs> to terrestrial radio than, than, than satellite will ever be. Um, you know, what can terrestrial radio do to, um, to remain relevant and to remain top of mind in terms of, you know, being the first place people go when they want to hear music or get information? I, I think it, you know, relevance is the key. As Karen was saying, it's got to be relevant. I think radio needs to remain uh, as much as possible a, a local business. You know, when you turn on uh, KROQ here in Los Angeles, you know, it's great to hear the, the, the great music that they, that they play for you, but you also want to know what's going on in Los Angeles. If that were being programmed from a studio, you know, in Rockefeller Center like Sirius or in Washington like XM, and, you know, they're never really relating to you and to what's going on in, in your neighborhood, then, you know, it's not really much better than just having a CD, you know, a trunk full of CDs, you know, in a, in a changer or having you know, some kind of, uh, you know, iPod or MP3 player just, you know, spitting out a, a playlist. So radio needs to, to remain, um, you know, relevant and local, needs to continue to fulfill that role of, you know, being an influencer and, you know, guiding you to music if that's what you're into or telling you what the news is, telling you what's important, you know, telling you, you know, where the traffic jam is on the 405. Yeah. Well, not, not only that, but what radio is really strong at and what I think radio always gets shortchanged on is the fact that local radio stations are probably some of the best branded businesses in all of media. E each station needs to stand for something. Each station has to have a very clear image or else they fail. KROQ in LA is probably one of the best examples when it comes to a music station. Um, you know, over the, they have a, a rich history, they have a great morning show, but they also, if you go to anybody who's a music fan, they know what KROQ is mm -hmm. and they know what KROQ is. But what's um, interesting is to different people, KROQ is different things in their mindset. Right, so over time, and, and so they've done a good job at, at, of reaching a large audience yet serving niches. Right, so the, the next the next step is, and having worked on my job before uh, the MTV was I worked for CBS TV, the TV group. We did a bunch of sites for the local TV channels, but we also did all the radio stations in New York. So one of the challenges there was to say, okay, Mr. Radio Station Guy, how do you get into this space, be true to your brand on a local level, what do you do? And that's before podcasts were really popular. There are a lot of opportunities for local radio to really expand and really get vertically deep in, in, into new media without <coughs> necessarily having to worry about some guy in Kansas listening to a station in New York. There are plenty of people in New York to build a business around, you know, online. Srivats, how do we monetize podcasting? Uh, you know, I've tried. I, I've looked. I've looked at that model. Um, honestly, it's it's. <laughs> You know, um, coming from the tech industry, we have this habit of hyping things way beyond what their capabilities are. Um, and podcasting about six months ago was all over the map. And, you know, I downloaded about seven podcasts. I said, okay, all right, it's some guy in Kansas and his wife that, you know, that do a little piece together. Wonderful. Talk dirty. You know, I've got, uh, you know, I've got an hour to spare to listen. Do I really want to listen to this? Um, so, you know, it's like podcasts are like sending satellites into space. They never come back, and you don't know what they're doing, okay? Uh, so anyone who comes and tells you, you know, if anyone comes and tells you, I'm going to build a Usually business. Usually they report back. Yeah. It's almost as no, one no, way no, as no, radio. No, 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 no. There's, a, there's a half-life. <laughs> We've lost a few of them. No, no, there's a half-life, after which they don't, they don't send you signals back, right? Uh, you know, are often doing and, something. Yeah, and, and, you know, when Maybe people come to me and say there are 8 million downloads of a podcast, I go, how many people actually listen right. to the damn thing? And they say, we don't know. There's a company that's, yeah. that's getting into, that, into the business of measuring podcast listening called Podbean. But, but, you know, but a disconnected listen yeah. is, is very hard to measure. I mean, that's the same problem I have with terrestrial radio and podcasts, which is, People say they like it. There's a, there's a big difference between, I'll tell you the math that works on the internet. 50% of the people who click will download. 50% of the people who download will listen. And 50% of the people who listen will listen to the whole thing. So you're, you're talking small numbers, okay? I see that on my website every day. 
okay? And anyone who's got an internet company will know the, the numbers that actually translate to what actually ends up truly happening at the other end is actually a small percentage. It's a, it's a sub 10% number. So of all the podcasts out there, if they say we did 8 million downloads, take 10% of that and say th those were the actual listens. But there's an element of letting reality get in the way there. See, with radio or with, you know, with our experience at MTV when it comes to doing any promotion in the new media space, you know, for example, when we did exclusive ringtones, it's about the promos I give them on air. It's not about somebody downloading a ringtone. It's about the exposure for the artist, Correct. the exposure Correct. for the product. That's the primary. So with radio, it's about, hey, Ampco, do you want to sponsor the you know, Bill Scoberle podcast? And they'll go, sure, we'll give you 35 spots in the week, and we'll put you in there, and we'll figure out a way to make this work, and we'll charge you a little extra to be part of the podcast page and on the audio. So that's what that, but yeah, uh, you know, Drew and what's her name, or whatever that was, you know, good luck. Drew I'm sure they're back to working well, at the deli now. I mean, but I mean, I will admit that I paid for a podcast last week. <laughs> I okay, one. paid for four podcasts. You went for so Ricky Gervais, didn't you? Yeah. And you so it made I mean, you feel bad. But I think that that's a good um, example of wanting more by something I'm already interested in and kind of back to the relevance thing. I mean, I can't get yeah. that anywhere else. I'm already a fan. I like his show. I like other stuff he did. He gave it to us for free for a while. I got hooked. And then I wanted more. So this I is Ricky's show? This is yeah. Ricky Gervais? Yeah. But the free show was better. The free show was better. I really? Will the paid shows are horrible. That I total, I 100% uh. agree, but I still paid. So the concept, I tipped over, I opened up my wallet, and I paid for it. So yeah, I mean that's content and programming and what what they yeah. did. I mean, which they could pull the nose up on it, but at the end of the day, they got me to open my wallet and I paid for so it. So when Audible but encodes something, what do they encode that at? Like you know, the lowest the possible. Yeah, very, very low. One. Yeah. No, yeah, but, but you know, a podcast yeah. really has to be looked at primarily, like you said, as a as a promotional vehicle. You can't track it. But then again, you know, I put an ad in in a magazine or I throw an ad out, a commercial out on the radio or on TV, and you don't track it you, in the same way. You don't have that direct feedback. I think we'll have technology that comes along and there'll be different types of delivery of podcasts where you can track. But in the meantime, it's a way to extend your brand, get it out there to people you want to keep in touch with. Um, I mean, how many CDs did AOL send out? And, you know, what's the conversion rate there? I know I got at least a dozen. Um, they make great coasters. But um, it's the same type of thing. You just expose, expose, expose. Well, you know, th um, and you'll sorry. get some people converting to, to a paying product somewhere down the line. Talking about new models, Karen, for a moment. I mean, this is going to be a weird one for this crowd, but Ollie and uh, who's, who are the two girls you worked on? Me? Karen, yeah. Allie and AJ? Oh, the, the artists, yeah. T tell a little bit about, I mean, breaking an artist a different way. I, and explain a little bit who they are, because this was an interesting story that Jay Frank told me. This um, is not a pitch, but it's an interesting case study. Well, I mean, I think that what we can do on the Internet that's harder with terrestrial radio is get, you know, you get that direct feedback from users. So, I mean, we have a few different programs. I will admit that it's outside of my area, but, you know, we look at the stuff that I do in premium services to complement that, where we can actually interact directly with users and have them vote and tell us what they think is going to be the best. And it's not like call in and vote. It's do it right there. It's here's a few songs by these artists. We're going to vote. And we can actually hit areas of the market that may have been um, untapped by traditional ways to market an artist. So we can kind of zoom in and say, well, look, this isn't being covered in this geographic area at all. We're going to try to move the dial there and, and kind of just be a more direct one-to-one -one marketer of an artist or content uh, and use those tools to, to break. break so in that particular, I mean, give a little background on this particular artist if you can, if you know the details. You know, I, I have to admit that I don't know the exact details of uh, My understanding was they took an art, uh, Allie, I, what, Allie and AJ? Yeah. These two girls that are on Disney Channel and with no airplay, they've sold almost a half a million. Yeah, See? yeah. I mean, I can right. give a couple. Zero, zero terrestrial radio play whatsoever. Yeah, and we've seen similar things. We have a program called Who's Next, um, which does the same thing. It breaks emerging artists. And we had My Chemical Romance on there and another band called Hawthorne Heights, which also eventually went gold. And they both, similar things, started four bands, sort of battle of the bands concept, competing against each other. Um, got a ton of exposure on the Yahoo Network, ton of exposure through that program, and eventually both of them also went gold. And I think, at least My Chemical Romance, I think everybody's heard of by now, is broken into the mainstream. And then we have Arctic Monkeys. <laughs> Other questions? Well, actually, we just did a very exciting thing with Arctic Monkeys, Ted. What? Oh, you at, MT, oh at MT. Oh, sure. Let me uh, talk about it. <laughs> 
Uh, actually, Arctic Monkeys, uh, they didn't do anything with anybody else except for MTV and our platforms. Uh, we filmed an MTV uh, U live concert with them last Saturday. Uh, we also did a live in-studio performance with them for Discover and Download Live, which will be featured uh, across Carrier and Wireless in the next uh, few weeks for MTV2. Very exciting. First time they've ever done it. Plus, they did a new song that no one's heard. Anyway. Shh. Yeah, well, so, so did I. So did my, uh, my kazoo band. Karen, <laughs> you had a question? As loud as you can. I mean, I can address that because we have a very successful business at Yahoo Music that's an exact blend of both of those models, and um, we have successfully monetized digital music, whether it's music videos or internet radio, um, over the past 10 years almost. So um, right now, I mean, that those contribute um, very in a large way, almost equally, to our revenue mix. And so what you can see happening is we have, you know, on music.yahoo.com, it's all mostly ad supported, we have music videos, we have big programs sponsored, um, like Who's Next it has a sponsor, we have Smash, which is sponsored by Pepsi, we have other programs that come up and are, are supported by these um, sponsors and, and they're hugely successful and the sponsors love them. And then we kind of have the paid complement to that on the premium services. So, I mean, I think it's all about using, giving users a choice and I think um, that's one thing that's kind of been talked about here. Um, we know we have a free version and a subscription version of our radio product. We don't really market the subscription version, but for users who don't want commercials, we can offer them a choice to, to actually pay for it and have a different experience. And I think that that is where things could head. I mean, and that might be a way to capture some of these, you know, P2P kids is say, okay, here, you can get a similar experience. We're going to advertise this. I mean, that's a very lucrative um, demographic to advertise to. And maybe they would put up with seeing ads here and there or whatever to kind of get the same experience that they're getting on P2P and, and the record labels make the same amount of money. No, it's, I think it's a different paradigm a little bit and you have to have a certain level of volume to be able to support a business like this. There's still the traditional ad models go by run of network or run a site and, and you know, click through rates and things like that. but. I think if you could deliver a vehicle that associates a brand with music, like we do, Pepsi Smash is a great example of that. That was a broadcast television show that we brought to the internet, and now Pepsi, clearly part of their strategy is to s associate themselves with music, and they want they want to have that as part of their brand identity, and we deliver that vehicle, and we do that for a lot of other brands as well. So it's it's beyond the, the banner ads. You know, I mean, we wrap them into the whole experience. Yeah, for, for us, I'll just say quickly. Um, since Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we come at it from a slightly different uh, direction from Yahoo. Our core competency is in subscriptions. I think you would probably never see an irrelevant ad come into the Rhapsody subscription service. Um, but we do run a, a, a <laughs> we do run a, 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 a free service that is ad and sponsorship supported, where you get 25 free plays per month, and then What's you that can called? subscribe. It's called Rhapsody 25, and then you Thank can you. subscribe to the regular Rhapsody service from that. And, uh, and so that is, that is somewhat ad-supported, but it's still not covering all of our licensing costs um, that we pay the labels. The model and we, we love, use and we like love you for it. <laughs> the model we use is a lot like Google. Uh, when you type in an artist, we put contextual ads that are served by our advertisers by themselves. So there are three models. There's a branded model, there's a subscription you know, pricing model, and there's a keyword-based model which, which works exactly like Google. So there are multiple ways that you can monetize it, but the underlying thing has got to be that you have to have the users who are actively using your system uh, for that kind of a model to start to work. Okay, so as we're gonna wrap things up here, is there a final question from the audience before I get close? You've already had one. Anybody who hasn't asked a question? I'm trying to be more democratic. Okay, we're back to you.
that cover just music? Does that cover music and film? Does that cover games? Does that cover audio books? Does that, how does indie, how do indie artists, I always, this comes up every panel. Right. I know. I, I, it's an interesting model. I'm, I'm real short opinion is that it, it's it's hard to quantify, and I think the actually the indie artist gets hurt in that model because they don't end up in the sample. Yeah, it's extremely complex to track all of it. Uh, the the computing power and the databases that are required to to how do you allocate that five dollars to Ted's point? Right. Who gets paid that? Does it all go to you too? Right. Does it? Uh, <laughs> you know. And does the cost of tracking it exceed the cost of the, the exceed the revenue? Yeah, and right. I mean, it, 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 it's being looked at. It's being looked at. Yeah. We've got to wrap up in a minute, so I want to start at the other end with John. Uh, I know this is a wide open question. It's probably too too vague, so I'll try and narrow it down a little bit. Twelve months from now, in the digital music ecosphere, what's the big difference between now and twelve months out? I'm not supposed to do any plugs, right? Oh, uh, Urge will exist. That's right. I'm Urge sorry. will exist. You know. um, <laughs> besides that, we will change the world. That's it. Okay. Well, I, hey, I, hey, I can earn my check. You know. Karen, pour a drink of water on him. <laughs> yeah, okay. You start. Um, I think in, I think 12 months from now, what we'll see is some uh, big technological advances outside of kind of the Apple stronghold. A little bit to what Drew said. I mean, the technology on the other side of the fence keeps getting better. It is being incorporated into mobile phones, so I think we will see the start of a run for the money over the next 12 months as, you know, companies like ours partner smartly with handset manufacturers and carriers, and we really um, work with the technology providers to crack that. Thanks. Drew? What am I up to in total right now? What? Total, total number. Doesn't right matter. <laughs> I'm going to blow this out. You're, you're way beyond where you need to be. Um, <laughs> our, our strategy... It's supposed to be one of these big thought, big picture things, not a... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, our, our, so our, our strategy all along has been one subscription, get it anywhere you want it, ditch all your CDs, and just pay the subscription, access it anywhere. Um, I think that the... What Apple has really succeeded with is the whole end-to-end -end experience, from the software all the way down to the hardware. I think that you'll see companies like ours um, really work directly with the device manufacturers, both on the handset side and on the MP3 player side to build and help them uh, build that that end-to-end -end experience to work perfectly with with the subscription services. Forgot the middle. From the terrestrial <laughs> view, what's 12 <laughs> months out? What's the big message? Um, 12 months from now, um, fewer iPods, more multimedia playback devices that also happen to make phone calls, mm -hmm. um, which will enable uh, the ever-increasing demand for time and place shifting for media consumption. Three votes. Join us. <laughs> uh, Twelve months from now, uh, I think the prices on all these services are going to dramatically fall. A lot of these services could theoretically not be in existence, um, and uh, just because the revenue models just don't keep up. And uh, you know, I'll reserve judgment till twelve months from now and see what happens. <laughs> will, you, will you be around in 12 months? Yeah, we will be. You okay, know good. Just check. I'm okay. So you know, be, yeah. meet us here next year. Yeah. Dave. Okay, so uh, to quantify, there will be about 80 million um, music-optimized mobile phones on the marketplace 12 months from now. Um, you will see a combination of internet and terrestrial content that is going to be delivered from the phones. The quality is going to be pretty good. Um, and uh, both Shakira and the Gorillas will have a number one hit. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Hopefully we asked, answered all your questions. See you back here in September.